as far as uh, you know, the Ashes stories go and stuff like that, those stories are definitely continuing. But here's the thing with that is that um, I sort of have to strike when the iron's hot. If the muse is upon me, if I'm inspired to create something, I got to go with it. And right now, all the ideas that are coming to me are associated with Billy's story at the moment. So um, rather than suppressing those, tucking them away and risking they may never come back again, I'm creating the stories that I'm inspired to create at the moment. And I will tell you that um, that's kind of how I operate. And my attention will vacillate back to ashes before long, and that's where my inspiration will be. And I'll switch back and forth between these. So I'll get hot on one and cold on another, and it it'll switch. So that's kind of where we're at right now. I've got lots of ideas um, having to do with Billy's storyline and only a few ideas on the Ashes ones. And that's kind of how it works for me. Um, I've said it before that I don't, I don't write anything. Um, I used to, but I don't anymore. So the, the ideas for the stories kind of grow organically and they they're sort of stream of consciousness in a way and all the dialogue is you know is kind of spoken in the moment impromptu improvisational i guess is the right word for it so i i don't write anything down um so the ideas are in my head and um i capture the ideas in video as they emerge as opposed to writing them down in an outline or something like that so as you can imagine, working that way, I have to be aware of the fact that if I take something and attempt to put it on the shelf, unless I plan on writing everything down, that idea could go away pretty quickly, eh, almost as quickly as it shows up. So, um, you know, when a story's hot, I just roll with it. And then uh, knowing full well that at some point... Uh, I'll hit a roadblock or a question in Billy's story that'll cause me to pause. And during that pause, I may, I'll pick up ashes again. And we'll just kind of keep moving around these things. Um, there was a time when I attempted to try and do things, say, the, the way that Rykon does, where he has a published schedule, right? And he, he says things like, Oh, on Tuesday, Tuesday I'm releasing this story, and Wednesday I'm releasing this story. And I don't know if he still does it, but he used to have it so detailed that he actually had the time of day that these things would be published even. Pretty amazing. And, I mean, Ry I find Rykon uh, to be ex really amazing for that reason. I mean, he's he's so good, and he's he's very, very disciplined. And I'm not. <laughs> I'm not disciplined. Um, so I kind of do this stuff as the muse ebbs and flows, right? And right now, what the hell was that? Billy's, Billy's my muse at the moment. He's the one who's inspiring me, and there's something about um, the emotion contained in his story that is timely for me right now. So I'm just... Uh, capitalizing on it while it's here. So that's kind of how it's happened. Uh, yeah, Fleet's story ended because I had a personal crisis. I had a personal crisis and I couldn't do Fleet anymore and I had to take a year off. And after taking a year off from the story, I couldn't pick it up again. I was just done. Um, the idea of picking up Fleet Story seemed it w was frustrating, and um, it seemed like I was doing an injustice to the character. I just couldn't do it anymore. So, yeah, I took a full year off of producing any videos. So, while my channel has been around for nearly five years, there, there was a whole year of that where I wasn't producing any content. Missed my jump. Okay, let me focus on this quick. I hope that answers your question, but if you dig deep, 
into the archives of Couch Warrior TV, you will find a, a channel update video in which I describe in detail um, what my personal crisis was. And it, um, I'm not... I don't have any qualms about talking about it. I made a whole video about it and, and kind of talked in detail about why I was doing what I was doing. So it was just a difficult time. Um, and, you know, it just felt like after a year, I had lost... I had lost the creative spark I had for that character and that character's story. So like what I was just talking about, about how I got to go where the muse is striking me. Well, by the time I, I got done with a year off from the channel and came back to it again, I felt like it was time for a new chapter. There was no muse left in me where Fleet was concerned. As much as I liked the character... One of the things that uh, I determined as well is that that style of storytelling was not the right style for me at all. In other words, okay, can I activate this one? Yeah, bitches. That's why I got a backup generator. Ha 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 ha. That's right. Um, Billy, prepared. Do I actually have it hooked up? Is it powering anything at the moment? Let's go look. That that was kind of where I determined that um, writing scripts was not what I wanted to be doing. You know? And the the style of, of storytelling with, with Fleet was very script-heavy. So I was spending a lot of time writing, and uh, I just determined that that was not a good thing for me to be doing. Uh, you're asking, did I console in all the materials I used to build with? No, not all of them, but like I said before, when I'm building, I'm, I'm building in God mode. So when you're in God mode, materials are a non-issue. You just build and build and build whatever you want. So what I did initially was I went through and I scrapped the entire area. And then after that, uh, I built as much as I could with what I had. The thing that you have to understand specifically about Chesco's conquest mod though is that it depending on where you decide to build the amount of stuff that you can scrap is really really limited even if you're using a mod like scrap everything uh, what I I'm using scrap everything and what I discovered about scrap everything is it allows me to scrap everything um, but only inside the vanilla designated settlement areas. If I start building using Chesco's mod outside of those default areas, there's very, very little that you can scrap. Stuff that you think, like, normally you could scrap, you can't. Um, so when I originally started building here, there was almost nothing that I could scrap. There were two cars that I could scrap, uh, two or three street signs, uh, a couple of stoplights, and a couple of grocery carts. And that was it. And you can't build dick with that. So what I did is I thought about my story. And in my story, in my story, the guy who owns the building that we are building on top of or used to own it his name was Harvey, and he was the boyfriend of Billy's grandmother. And so Billy elected to build on top of this, this building because it was Harvey's, because he was familiar with the building, and because he knew that Harvey was building a bomb shelter 
on the roof of this building. So he built here because he already knew there was some infrastructure. And in my story, basically what I explained in my story is that Billy went down inside this building and pulled the materials out from inside the building that he needed to build on the roof. So he broke down furniture, he took down piping that wasn't being used, he took, you know, uh, any wood that he could find, you know, junk like that, and, and, you know, shit from the boiler room, whatever he could find, and he used that to build on the roof. So that's kind of how my story laid out. And that's that's how I role play. I mean, if I'm if I'm role playing a character, I come up with an idea in my head about how I want to do something and as long as the story is cohesive in my brain, I don't give a shit about anything else. If it means I go into god mode and I build something that makes me happy, then that's what I do. Um, and so it, in the context of of the Saint Billy storyline, that's what we understand is happening is that Billy took the materials from inside the building when he gutted the inside of the building and he used those to construct his little fortress on the roof. That's kind of how that worked out. Uh, What will Billy think of the Brotherhood of Steel? I don't know. I'll decide that when I get there. I haven't decided what Billy is going to think of them yet. It depends on... It depends on what he thinks of their philosophy. I mean, as 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 I see Billy right now, I don't think he would like them. I think he would I think he would have a problem with the Brotherhood of Steel. So uh but that's not to say that, you know, it'll always be that way. Um who knows. The the way that I look at it is that that Billy's uh, Billy's attitude toward these different organizations is a is a changing thing. You know, if if Billy is going to be in favor of an organization or is going to join an organization, that organization has to prove something to him. He has to prove that they're worth that they're worth it, that they're worth dealing with. And Billy's got a certain set of ideals that he's trying to live up to. So if the Brotherhood of Steel quest line presents in a way that Billy would find favorable, then yeah, he he may he may find them interesting. He may side with them or whatever. Um, but based on what I what I know of them so far, and based on where Billy is at as a character currently, I would say probably not at the moment. I don't think that he would have a lot of respect for that organization because. What we've seen of Billy is that he has he has a problem he has a problem with bureaucracy he has a problem with authority he has a problem with people telling other people what to do um, you know stuff like that and and he would um, be really critical of their agenda I think um, seeing their agenda as being very self serving uh, so. I don't think that he would I don't think that he would buy what they were selling right now personally. That's my opinion. But again, as I said, characters are always changing and evolving, so that might change. That might change. It just depends on circumstance and um as I as I mentioned before too, this the story is, you know, it's well, that's interesting. Somewhat stream of consciousness, right? So I don't have any hard and fast plan that says, and then at this stage in the story, Billy is going to join the Brotherhood of Steel. I don't think about that. I don't think that far ahead. Um, What the adventure in all of this for me is that I don't know what's going to happen. And um, that is a cool thing to do in Skyrim, but it's even more cool for me to do it here in Fallout 4 because I literally don't know. I don't know the details of the quest lines. So I don't know what's going to happen, um, which means in this story I have even less clue how it's going to end uh, than I than I have in my Skyrim stories because you know the Skyrim stuff I know forwards and backwards. So uh, 
Uh, he has not been running all over the place to find his son because it's not his son. And he's conflicted about it. He believes that... He believes that... Um, Sean is a product of Nora's infidelity while he was away at the war. And so he's got very mixed feelings about, about Sean. And about... He has some resentment towards Nora. And... A reflection of that is his dragging his feet. He said that he was going to go find Sean, and he will go find Sean. But he's in this mode right now where he's conflicted about what to do about Sean. And I think that for him, not going to Diamond City is is probably kind of a subconscious avoidance of something that's painful to him. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it could have been, you know, um, you know, if you, if you go back, if you go back and listen to, I think it's the, the second episode. Not the prologue, but the very first video episode. The prologue was audio only. But if you go and listen to episode one... Is it one? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's it's his monologue in episode one where he, he talks about having come home from Anchorage after, after you know, being at being out in the field for 15 months to find Nora with an infant. But he also talks about how about how she was really, really insistent that it was that it was his child. You know, that it that it was absolutely his child that she hadn't been with any other men. And you can hear as as Billy tries to puzzle through that, right? He knows that it's physically impossible for it to be his child, but there's also part of him that has a hard time believing that Nora could lie to him. And so he, you know, he, he puzzles over it, he thinks about it, he's, he's conflicted about it a lot, um, but he doesn't know what to believe. So if you go back and listen to that, you kind of get some clues as to what his you know, his, his psychology around all this, his, you know, what, what is, what is his brain and his heart are telling him, you know? Yeah, I mean, we don't know a whole lot about Billy's friends yet. Um, we know that he had a group of friends that he ran with that were, kind of the equivalent of you know biker thugs probably um, one of the things that he mentions in that same episode um, in the first video episode is that he got into trouble with the law and in an effort to kind of change his change his life around uh, he and he enlisted in the military and being in the military was part of his his effort to reinvent himself and so uh one thing that we we can surmise from that is that the guys that he was running with were probably bad news you know and and we can we can tell from from some of his monologues and stuff like that that he was obviously the the kind of person who who liked to fight, who liked to get into scraps, who liked to smoke and drink and and be rowdy and you know probably do unsavory things with his friends because it was cool or it was fun or whatever. And then uh, he got to a point in his life at, at some point that will probably be the circumstances will probably be explained in the story as we go forward. But at at some point he came to the realization that. If he was going to change his life, he, he needed to completely cut himself off from what he had been doing previously. And, uh, you know, then we see this whole enlisting in the army and a lot of different things happen then. And I, I believe that Billy is a 
person who found purpose in the military. Um, and that is also where perhaps he began to realize that he was capable of good things and that he wasn't a worthless person. So I got into a conversation recently with someone in the comments um, who said that that Billy initially came off um, as, you know, kind of a jerk or a no-good type of person, but that... Um, what? Who's there? That he was seeing glimmers of a of a hero, right? And I I agree. I mean, I I think that that in his heart, I think that Billy is a hero. You know, I think he he's he's capable of of a lot of good. And I think what we've seen of him so far in the story is that he's actually done a lot of good in the wasteland. He's had a big impact. And he's only been in the wasteland for a couple of months, um, you know. So I, I think there's there's something of a little bit of you know kind of an inspirational story uh, to Billy and and what he's doing. But you, from you know from his monologues and you know things like that, you can tell that he is a person who's kind of self-deprecating. He thinks of himself as a no-good person. He thinks of himself as a person who has nothing to give. Um, but continually, he keeps demonstrating through his actions the opposite. What the hell was that? And um, I think part of that gets to who he is as a person in his core, right? He expresses great undying love for his, his grandmother and, uh, you know, for Nora and, you know, stuff like that. And he does, he does lots of uh, uh, good things and stuff like that. So at his core, he he must be a decent person. But also, there's the whole driving force of of Nora and Nora's Nora's impact, ongoing impact on his life, even though she's dead. You know, so I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's exactly right. He's he's a good person who's been through a lot of bad. And when you think about it, one of the things that that we haven't even discussed yet is is we've established in the story that one of the characteristics of of Billy is that he he mentions more than once being uh being raised by his grandmother which begs the question what about his mother and father what happened to them what happened in his childhood that he would have to be raised by his grandmother um, we haven't even answered that question, but my guess is whatever it was, it had a big impact on who he became as an adult and how he thinks of himself. You know, I mean, all that stuff, all that kind of stuff matters. So uh, we'll see some of that bear itself out, I suppose, in the story too. But again, I don't have any specific plan. I lay the groundwork. And I give myself plenty of fertile ground to work with. And then I just see what comes. Uh, one of the other things that I, I have not really addressed is vats, the issue of vats. I'm really not a, a big lover of vats, and you'll notice that the only time I go into vats is when I go into it by accident. So I'm thinking about it, and I'm trying to think of the circumstances in which I would use vats, because they, I think there's some, some really great perks that are kind of reliant on vats or influence vats in interesting ways. Um, so I'm still kind of on the fence about how I'm going to use it. I think if I do use it, I'm going to use it in some very specific ways. Like maybe I'll use vats only associated with melee combat or melee combat. Excuse me. People hate it when I say melee. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to use vats. Not, not a huge fan, but, uh, I figure it's got to play a role at some point, so I think I would probably just consider limiting the way that I use it, so.
Uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel. I, I appreciate that. Um, to me, that's part of the adventure. Like, what I think is cool is I, I feel like the sweet spot for me is somewhere like a mix between a story and a role play. I mean, if, if people were, when people ask me what it is that I do, I always describe it as a story. I will always, first and foremost, describe it as a story. But the way that the story evolves is, is another matter entirely. And while it would be one way that a person could do it, of course, is to kind of write down what's going to happen. Uh, you know, and just follow it and say, I'm going to do these quests and they're going to be chained together in this way and they're going to have this meaning or this purpose, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's one way to do it. But the way that I like to do it is to have an idea of the direction I'm going, but really focus on getting in touch with the character, understanding who the character is, what their motivations are, what their weaknesses are, what their desires are. Hey, uh, I think someone's out there. How they, how they think and all of that stuff. And then just have a very, very rough outline all clear. of the actual story. And then just allow it to evolve inside of that framework because I think what I like about that is it it preserves it preserves a little adventure and mystery for me as well which I think is kind of cool and important and I I think it's kind of a unique thing that to be able to tell a story where um you know you don't know exactly everything that's going to happen so it it means oh. that there's there's you know plenty of mystery for everybody who's watching but there's also some mystery for me and some excitement and it helps to keep me engaged in the story because i know that i've i've got a rough idea of how things are happening but i could turn a corner and i could encounter a situation that might turn my entire story on its head uh, i never know for sure and that kind of mystery i think keeps me engaged as well as makes it interesting for everyone else because then it it goes from being just a story to sort of almost being like an experiment that we're all participating in, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, I don't usually swear in my videos, but that's who Billy is. Don't get me wrong, I love swearing. I do love swearing. Oh, just something so satisfying about throwing out the F word sometimes feels so good. But uh, it's not something that I typically do in my videos. Um, the Ashes series is intended to be um, safe for kids and safe for work. But when it came to Billy's story, it was hard for me to imagine Billy as a person expressing himself in any other way, given his background and where he came from. And... Uh, and all of that. So, yeah, he cusses a lot. I mean, I cuss a lot in those. But, um, I mean, he uses he uses the F word like filler. You know, like some people say like, like all the time or whatever when they're talking. Um, he almost uses the F word as filler. And um, I've known people like that. I've known quite a few people like that, actually. Um... So there's, there's part of me that kind of understands where he's coming from with that. Um, notice when he does his Hey Nora segments, he doesn't swear very much in his Hey Nora segments. The only time that he swears in the Hey Nora segments is when he's under duress, when he's... Um, when he's ticked off or something like that, then, then he will swear in those segments. But I tend to think that, in part, that is a reflection of him, I think, denying himself in her presence, as if 
when he was in the presence of Nora, when he was in the presence of his wife, fiance, girlfriend, he felt compelled to act like someone other than who he really was. And um, I think there's something really interesting about that. I, and I think it gets back to this idea that we get sort of the, the impression of Billy that he has in his past and maybe still does to some degree feel as if he was not good enough for Nora. And in order to be good enough for her, he had to be someone other than who he really was when he was around her. He had to pretend that he was not from the street. He had to pretend that he was, you know, someone else or maybe not all of himself. Right. So, in, in a way, that's kind of sad because he's, he's denying who he really is because he thinks he has to do that in order for someone to love him. And I, I think that's important distinction. So when you listen to those, think about that a little bit and notice when he does swear. When he does swear in his Hey Nora segments, it's because he's under duress. And one of the most recent ones we, we heard was his questioning Nora about where she was. Was she in heaven? And he sounded angry, really angry. Um, it, it was kind of a reflection of him being angry with God, being angry with his situation, being upset that Nora was gone and he was still here. Um, and and some of that came out, I think, um, as, I don't know, I guess distress, you know. And then he, he was swearing. He was swearing in anger in her presence, kind of revealing who he really was, you know? So anyway, I think that's kind of an interesting, an interesting thing. Yeah. And, and we've, uh, Daniel, I, I was just reading yours and in Billy's defense, I think it's all right for him to swear when talking to Nora because of the Sean fiasco. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, if you were to take all of the Hey Nora segments and string them out, what you would see is a man who's very confused and very conflicted about how he feels about Nora. We've had at least a couple of those segments where he expresses resentment towards her, and we've had some where he talks about really missing her and feeling like he's going to fall apart, you know, and all this kind of stuff and how he's, you know, hanging by a thread because of... Um, his memories of Nora, and he also talks about how she was a good person and how he's trying to live up to what he thinks she would do in this situation with distributing water for free and, you know, doing all of these things. But at the same time, we know that he harbors in his heart this, these questions about her integrity because of what he sees as this infidelity, right? So it's complicated, but I think it's real. It's pretty cool. I feel like um, Billy is more himself around Mama Murphy than he is around Preston. Uh, his his relationship with Preston seems to be very businesslike, um, and he's talked about that in episodes as well, where Preston has has a role and Billy has a role, and everything is going to work smoothly as long as they each fulfill their roles and they don't try and cross over. Um, And I, I think the roles that they fill are also a reflection of their personalities in a way where, you know, Billy is kind of like this solitary figure out wandering the wasteland, doing the dirty work. Um, but there's something inspirational about what he does, even though he maybe doesn't intend it to be. It is because he's attracting people to the settlements. He's making people believe that there's hope. Whereas Preston is more buttoned down and organized and well-spoken and, you know, stuff like that. And he's, you know, back at the settlement, organizing things and managing people and setting up guard shifts and, you know, you know stuff like that. Kind of a lot of the stuff that I guess maybe a mayor would do in a way. 
And I think that that role suits his personality, which is just kind of a thing that fell together. So that's pretty cool, I think. No, with Billy, I'm not using a psych profile. Um, I eventually abandoned using the psychological profile because there were too many holes in the psychological profile. Um, and with Billy, I focused more on trying to flesh out his personality through... Um, uh, through... I guess, traits, more or less. So here's the, here's the basic gist of it. I'll, I'll give you like the, the, the basics of, of how the things I'm thinking about when I, when I put together Billy. So when I'm thinking about a story, I'm thinking about um, the character is going from kind of what they consider at a given time to be normal and the destination is a new normal. So when we talk about Billy, well, I'm looking at it as for him, normal was living in the normal world, living in suburbia and the new normal is coming to terms with the fact that he lives in this wasteland and it's not going away and he needs to learn how to cope. That's the new normal. So the first thing I'm looking at is that journey. What is the journey? We're starting from normal to new normal and to figure out what those things are. And that's, that's the basic setup of, you know, that's the, this huge, broad framework, right, that the character is going to be changing within. So then I've got to think about how do, I, how do I characterize who Billy is as a character? And so the first thing I'm thinking about is this character journey from, from the old normal to the new normal and trying to understand, okay, is this character ready to take the journey? Do I know what I need to know about this character so that he can take this journey? And what do I need to know about him? I need to know some things about psychologically about him. I need to know, you know, is he psychologically ready? Is he morally ready for the journey? And what I mean by that is, do I understand enough about Billy from a psychological perspective to be able to tell a story about him? And do I understand enough about Billy, norm, his morality? And so by breaking it down like that, what do I understand about him psychologically and morally? I can start to, you know, answer some, some questions, right? And I, I kind of start with some really basic stuff to say... To, to try and figure out what what are his vulnerabilities because ultimately what I what I want to do is figure out what are his vulnerabilities so that I can start building around those things. The problem with the psychological profile is it lays out stuff like loyalty and selfishness and cruelty and then you give a rating. So what is your character's loyalty? Is it is it low sum total none, right? That kind of thing? Well, that's great and everything, but loyal to what? That's the problem. I mean, all of this stuff is on a continuum, right? You can have a character who is totally loyal to one person, but not loyal at all to another. And you could say the same thing for their loyalty toward an organization, right? And so when you start looking at it that way, it, it becomes... Uh, the psychological profile becomes way too shallow, unless you're prepared to make 10 or 12 different psych profiles for different circumstances, and that just starts to seem clunky. So I think what, what, what we need is a much more organic way to try and get in touch with who a character is. So usually I start with this question of what's their vulnerability, and, and that's basically asking the question, what about the character is broken? You know, what's, what's the flaw? And the story... The journey for the character is about attempting to fix whatever that flaw is in some way. I mean, that's kind of the meta, <laughs> you know? So when I look at Billy, there's, you know, there's a couple of different things, right? But um, one, one example would be um, 
what what is broken about Billy? His relationship with forgiveness is broken. He has he has trouble with forgiveness. And so we we see this, right? He he goes back and forth on on how he feels about Nora. This is an, uh, a reflection of his struggle with whether or not he can forgive her. One minute it seems like he has, and then the next minute it seems like he's full of anger and resentment. We see the same thing about his his feelings towards organizations and bureaucracy and and you know cultural constructs, you know stuff like that, societal constructs, I guess where, uh, you know, he knows rationally that science in and of itself is not a bad thing, but we, we hear him lashing out at organizations that he feels are responsible for science that may have compromised the world that he used to know, right? Stuff like that. Um, so I, I think about, you know, what's what's broken about him and how does that stuff manifest itself you know is it is it guilt is it shame what is it you know what what's broken and then i i think about as a person then how is he dealing with this brokenness you know um how is he self-medicating you know because he he has such a struggle with this idea of forgiveness especially when it comes to nora how is he self-medicating well, there's the obvious stuff, right? I mean, he smokes. Probably he smokes too much. Uh, he probably drinks too much, although he's not addicted to chems yet. It's, it's a danger for him, right? But I think the other way that Billy self-medicates is that he engages in a lot of violence. <laughs> he distracts himself through violence, and uh, he isolates himself. You know, he doesn't like being back at Sanctuary for too long. If he stays back amongst those people for too long, he's afraid that he's going to start caring about them. Um, he's going to start caring about what's going on in their lives, and he would rather not know, right? So he self-medicates by secluding himself, by being solitary, by isolating himself, which means he's out running around the wasteland all the time, and he's saying that he's doing it because he's trying to help people, but in a large part, he's doing it because he's self-medicating, because he has this problem with forgiveness. He doesn't want to think about all that shit, right? So he's doing what he's doing. Um, so, you know, I think about stuff like that. And then when it comes to actual tools, again, you know, just kind of putting down on a, on a piece of paper some really basic, basic information that's biographical information. So I needed to know some basic stuff so I could tell the story and he would seem like a real character. So I was kind of like, okay, let's see. Uh, pretty smart in high school, but got in a lot of trouble, right? Um, was, was really into hockey. He's got some sports heroes. Raised by his grandmother. Grew up in Back Bay. Um, you know, just really basic stuff like that. Not like a whole narrative history, but just the basics. And then uh, from there, it was a vignette. Making a character vignette. And for me, the prologue was the vignette. When I recorded the prologue, that was the first time I'd ever heard Billy's voice. And it was the first time that I'd ever heard, you know, I'd, I'd ever considered anything about Billy's feelings about religion and stuff like that. And so I did that little vignette, and sometimes a dialogue, in my opinion, a dialogue situation is the best thing that you can do to try and get in touch with who a character is. So that's, shit, that's a super long answer to that question, but um, I abandoned using the psych profile a long time ago just because it just, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And Joe and I have talked about it at length. We actually talked about uh, the idea of bringing back the psych profile and trying to mod the psych profile in such a way that it would, it would be more effective as a guideline. Um, but we haven't really gotten around to it, and it's possible that we may do that as a future episode of the podcast. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a struggle, you know. I think just stick to the basics. And, again, I'm, I'm saying don't put together an exhaustive biography, but if that's what you want to do, do that, right? I do it the way that I do it because I want the character's background to be defined enough that he feels real, 
but open enough that I still have the freedom to add things in if I become inspired, right? Like if I if I put out a five-page document explaining his whole personal history since he was born to the moment that the adventure started, I would be leaving myself with no wiggle room to add additional things in later that would give him color. So that gives me the flexibility. So if something happens in the game that I want to tie into his personality or background, I, I have the flexibility to do that, right? So that's kind of why I do that, but anyway. Yeah, he's got a he's got a very interesting view on science. Um, like like I said, it I think you know probably in his heart, Billy knows that that's an irrational point of view. That it's not science that's bad. That it's people that are bad, and they can use you know you can use anything for bad purposes. But one of the things that we understand about Billy is that he's got a real problem with authority and he's got a big problem with um, bureaucracy. He's talked about bureaucracy as well, about how he doesn't want the Minutemen to turn into a bureaucracy because as soon as it does, uh, people start using the bureaucracy as an excuse uh, to basically ignore moral questions. So they can say, yeah, it was okay to, you know, we everybody in that village died, but it wasn't my fault. It was the bureaucracy that made the decision, and I was, I was powerless to, to change it, or I was just following orders, or, you know, some other excuse, right? And the way that he looks at the world now is he looks around and says, all of this shit that surrounds me right now, all of this destruction was caused by bureaucracy, was caused by the fact that people got together in big groups, whether it was religious, cultural, business, military, and they made a bunch of decisions that were detrimental to the world that he doesn't think would have happened if people were forced to take personal responsibility for their decisions, right? So he sees bureaucracy as the enemy. He sees bureaucracy as the real, true enemy. And science is a part of that bureaucracy. There is a science bureaucracy the same way there is a religious or governmental bureaucracy. So that's kind of um, Billy's view on the world right now is uh, he looks at this fucked up situation and he says, you know, this wouldn't have happened if people had been forced to own their decisions. If there was someone, you know, if there was someone who was forced to own the decision to take some of these heinous actions or whatever, then they may have been more likely not to do it, you know, or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the idea of of putting enemies in conflict with one another is a classic one. I mean, it's something that that I've done with a lot of my characters. Um, and you know, I Billy will definitely get there with that. But for that technique to work, it's it's either based on stealth or speed or both. And so far, um, some of the enemies that. Uh, Billy is facing are are sort of really difficult to outrun, to outmaneuver, and his his stealth is not good enough yet that he can kind of just literally sneak around them. So I don't know. We'll we'll have to see how it shakes out. But definitely, there have been a number of circumstances where I ha I would have loved to have been able to do that. 
Uh, in a recent episode, I did run, I did run one of the robot death squads. In fact, it took place right here, where I was fighting ferals this direction, and I got attacked by a robot death squad from behind, and I just ran the robots into the ferals, um, and the robots made very very fast work of the ferals for me. But that was only because you know that that situation just dropped right in my lap. I don't, I don't know if I could have set it up because a lot of those robots are so damn fast that I can't, I can't really outrun them once they're after me. I got to look for choke points and places to hide and it becomes pretty, pretty dicey. So. Okay, you wanted to know if the game rebuilds places as the game progresses, or have you done that off camera between co recordings? Um, what kind of places do you mean? Like, uh, oh, you're probably talking about like Sanctuary, the town and Sanctuary and stuff. Um, yeah. How do I answer that exactly? I am doing a lot of stuff off camera, but. I'm using a um, I'm using a mod called Sim Settlements, and basically what it does is it turns your it, it it has the capability of turning your settlements basically into like a Sim game. So what I did is I installed Sim Settlements, and then uh, I used the tools in Sim Settlements to basically plot out areas of land where settlers were allowed to build structures. And then I allowed them to build their own structures. So basically what that does is it means that um, Billy can leave Sanctuary and he can go wander the wasteland for a couple of weeks and come back and he will find... Uh, new agricultural land, he'll find new housing structures, he'll find new businesses. So as the settlement attracts new settlers, they will automatically be assigned to open beds or open housing, and then they will start building. So um, there was a recent episode where at the beginning of the episode, I went out to kill some feral ghouls, and by the time I got back to Sanctuary after killing the ferals, one of the buildings in town had a second level on it that wasn't there when I left in the morning. And so that's kind of, some of that stuff is happening, but you have to get in there and set up where the plots of land are going to be. So setting up the plots of land and building the walls that went around the settlement and stuff, that was all stuff that I did off camera because in my story, it's not Billy that's doing that work. It's the people in the village who are doing the work. It's Preston who's doing the work while Billy is gone. Um, if I was trying to simulate Billy actually doing the work, then I might include some of that footage in the actual story. But because it wasn't Billy doing the work, I wanted him to come back and be surprised at the scale of Sanctuary. I did that stuff off camera. So... That's kind of how I'm doing it. And then there, there's a lot of building, like the building I did tonight. I'm doing that off camera as well because, I mean, each one of the things that I built tonight took an, you know, at least an hour or maybe a, a little more to create. And that's not something that I want to do on camera in the story because it's just not conducive to good storytelling, right? It's not... Um, I don't want people to get sidetracked from the story because they're watching me run around doing a bunch of clunky building. I'd rather do that in a live stream or something like that and then uh, have people be able to take in that footage if they want to watch it as opposed to making it, you know, integrating it into the story where people feel like they got to get through it, like it's drudgery before they can get back to the story. So that's kind of the model I'm following here, but, um, you know, I don't know. It's keeping me from getting distracted from the story, and it's also giving me some really kind of fun content to do as live streams because the building part of it is fun. It's just fun to do, and uh, it's kind of a lighthearted and casual thing that you can do in the context of a live stream. So that's kind of why I'm doing that. Glad you're here, by the way, Shirley. Welcome. Yeah, the, the uh, Sim Settlements mod is amazing, and it's very, very well done. Ex 
extremely well done, very professionally done. It's the kind of mod that you, sh you should be able to install and it, you know, not be at risk of any funk, you know, in your saved games and stuff like that. So, um, I'm very, I've been very impressed with it. And there were a bunch of updates that rolled out for it recently that allow you to create industrial plots too, where people can start, you know, businesses like scrap yards and stuff like that too. So. Was the legendary Deathclaw a random encounter? Yes, it was a random encounter. I was not planning that. I got into the bus and looked out the window, and there it was, and I was like, holy shit, perfect. And so when I was going through the production, I was just really looking for the most menacing music I could find or put together as, as a backdrop for that experience. And here's a great example. I love this question, Ted, because here is a great example of how I talk about I don't know exactly what's going to happen, and I'm just responding. I did not know that that death claw was going to show up. I assumed I was going to traipse across town and maybe go out the other side and keep going. I wasn't planning on stopping in Malden. But it was um, it was the confrontation with the death claw that caused me to spend a lot of ammunition I wasn't planning on using. And then I was able to integrate that into the next episode of the story in, I think, a really interesting way um, that is going to have a long-term impact on the rest of the story. So that's kind of, a, I think, a great example. So anyway, um, yeah, that was a good question, Ted, because uh, I didn't know that was going to happen, and it was like, it was kind of dramatic, and uh, I really liked how it how it turned out. So, and it and it has a it has a significant impact on episode 22 uh, and caused me to explore some things that I wasn't planning on exploring. So 